Okay, I'm totally freaking out now. Uh, this is incredible. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks um, for having me. First of all, uh, so the World Wide Web, thank you. I've heard of it. <laughs> On behalf of everybody here and listening <laughs> around the world, thanks, thanks for that. We, we really appreciate it. I'll take my very small slice of the credit. Yeah, well, uh, any slice is, is pretty good. No, we, uh, we have, uh, you know, Mark is a, is a hero of mine, and we've been trying really relentlessly for years to get you to come, and uh, we just, uh, it's a great honor to have you. Um, so I actually was hoping we could start, you know, I think people know the Hollywood version of the story of creating Netscape and, and Mozilla, and certainly the way I remember the story is you basically had the idea for it, you put it up on the nascent World Wide Web, and then boom, you're basically on the cover of magazines like five seconds later. So it was pretty easy, and you didn't have to overcome much skepticism, and it was never hard. Uh, that's how it was communicated to me, and I'm wondering if you could give us some insight into what it was really like. Actually, we pivoted twice. No. No, we, we, we yeah, it didn't, is yet maybe a third of the number of times we should have had to, but um, <laughs> that's the good news. The bad news is this is back when pivots were still called fuck-ups. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I do. So it was actually very, it's actually, it goes back to something Drew said about the, the big ideas that start out looking really small. So we, the, a group of us had, had built the Mosaic browser at University of Illinois sort of as a, essentially almost as a science project, um, actually funded by the National Science Foundation until they <laughs> stopped funding us because they said it wasn't science anymore. True, true story, by the way. They said uh, the, no, no, no science and unclear uh, actual applicability to the real world. <laughs> um, I, have the, I have the cover sheet of the denied grant proposal. Um, that sent us out into the real world. So, um, so we, 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 my, my partner Jim Clark and I, when we decided to start a company, we, we didn't actually start with the idea of doing the browser, doing what became Mosaic, because we, we didn't think that would be a real thing. So we started out building, actually at the time, for those of you in the room who are my age or older, you'll remember interactive television uh, was gonna be the wave of the future. Uh, 20 years ago, according to all the big company CEOs, and so we were gonna build the first software company for interactive television. Um, and then we went out actually in the market, discovered that there actually was no such thing. <laughs> Um, as interactive television, uh, the systems were never going to exist. Uh, Time Warner had rolled out uh, 60 homes in Florida uh, with $40,000 Silicon Graphics workstations, and they called that interactive TV. They just hadn't, weren't able to figure out how to get the $40,000 down to $400. Um, and the TV industry is still working on that. So we gave up on that idea, luckily, before we went very far. Um, and then the second idea was actually more interesting. It was, the at the time, it was what today would be Xbox Live or the PlayStation Network, except we were going to do it for the Nintendo 64, um, which was slightly premature. Uh, and, and, and in fact, we were, of course, on dial-up modems. And so I went, I actually spreadsheeted out the whole thing and how many modems we would need and how many pops we would need for dial-up for, for games. And luckily, we punched on that one. And literally, it was like, OK, should we like just give up on this whole thing, or should we try this browser? Um, and, that, and that was the, the beginning of Netscape. And how did you know you were onto something once you made that choice? Yeah, so, well, two things happened. One is um, the, the Mosaic actually, Mosaic continued after, after we left, um, and we, but we, we kept our university, so it lacked security, so I kept myself on all the mailing lists, um, all the internal mailing lists, including all the um, inbound. I was the, I was the main customer support rep, and so I was getting all the, you know, the customer support emails are just bombarding in, which was a, a good sign. Um, and then um, the other thing was we had a mailing list for inquiries for commercial opportunities. Because we had put it out under a split license. We said it's free for academic and nonprofit use, but you have to pay for commercial use. We just left undefined what that meant or what the pricing would be. We were just kind of, we were, we were out kind of fishing. And I think when it got up to like, I don't know, 1,400 emails in that box from licensing requests, at a certain point, the light bulb went on and said, oh, this might actually be a business. Um, and so one is Mosaic just kept going. Um, and then there was a second phase to it when we released uh, Netscape Navigator and the first Netscape server products where we, we, we hit product market fit as a company. Um, and, and that was about a year and a half later. Um, and then it just, it just went. So product market fit, that's a phrase that we use all the time. I learned it from your blog, um, you know, back when you used to blog a lot more. Yeah. So, you know, we miss, we miss it. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, one of the things that inspired me to write about being, did everything to do with startups, it wasn't so cool when you were doing it. Uh, so you were a pioneer in that way. Uh, and so I feel like people throw around the term product market fit all the time. And I, and I, of course, always get people who call me and they want my help to help them figure out if they have product market fit. I always tell them, well, the fact that you're calling me makes it pretty clear that you do not have product market fit. Right. It's usually obvious. But so for you, it's sort of like a call of like, it. did I just have sex? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> so you're saying you would know. <laughs> well, hopefully at some hopefully point. Hopefully you yeah, would know. At so some point. Help, help us understand what is it really like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Yeah, so it. it, it for those of us who have never had the experience. Yeah. 
Do you, uh, do you, have, do you have a whiteboard? <laughs> <laughs> For you, anything, Mark. Okay, so um, it, it, it's actually a it actually is a feeling. I mean, there's numbers, and you can you can see it on the on the graphs. But it, it's actually a feeling. And I the, the the best line I ever heard my old boss Jim Barstale said the key to you know the key to being successful in life is to find a parade and jump in front of it. Um, and it's it's a lot like that. It's like all of a sudden, it, and, and it's sort of like another way to think about it is you 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 know startup every day is just like you know you're constantly pounding your head against against the wall like you know oh my god is this ever going to work is this ever going to work. When you hit product market fit, you actually immediately start to have the exact opposite feeling, which is, oh my God, this thing is running away from me, right? This this thing is like something has happened. This thing has 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 caught, um, and you're, if you're even just a little bit paranoid, you immediately start thinking, oh my God, I need to figure out how to get my company to actually be able to grab this opportunity um, that we are not actually prepared to go grab because we're we're not we're not built for it. We haven't been in the phase of trying to go take the market. We've been trying to build the product, but all of a sudden it's like, oh my God. We have to go get the market. And then, by the way, if you're paranoid like me, it's, oh, my God, if we don't do it, somebody else is going to. Um, and there are you know, lots of stories in the history of our industry about early movers, you know, first movers who got product market fit, and then somebody else came out of left field and just took the market out from underneath them. Um, and so it's, it, to me, it's that feeling in the pit of your stomach of, oh, my God, it's a completely new ball game. You know, if anything, the pressure goes up because you have to build the company to actually go get the market. Um, but it really is a very, very distinct feeling. And in my experience, people who have gone through it, you know, it, it was fairly obvious. Yeah. Uh, it seems like a lot of people think that you get to product market fit and then you're done. Yeah. You're basically, the company is, is completely over at that yeah. point. You've done everything that an entrepreneur needs to, be, needs to accomplish. Like, what's your view on how the skill sets and the challenges change before and after? So it gets harder, more stressful, more paranoia. Yeah, so well, the, the, the couple things. One is the company has to get built, right? It really isn't a company until it hits product market fit, which is to say, right, it really isn't a company until it actually has to go get the market. It has to go service all the customers, right? And not just a few customers, but like all the customers, right? And customers are right, herd animals, and they tend to move all at once uh, or in, in very short order. People are social, and so they, 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 whenever you know, anybody's, your friends or colleagues are all doing something, there's a very strong inc inclination to jump on it. And so the demand kind of arrives often, you know, kind of feels like it's arriving all at the same time. Um, and so you have to build the company uh, to, to, uh, to actually go do that. And so it's at that point that usually the hiring you know, really starts to explode. It's at that point that you have to start, you know, international becomes a really, really big deal. Right? Or you have to start making the really tough question of, do I go do international or do I just wait, do the US, let other people do international and then come back later and either buy them or try to, you know, uh, try to go and ultimately take it over. So that's a big part of it. Um, you know, the other part is the, the, the you know, sales and marketing skill set you know, becomes far more important, which is you actually have to build the engine uh, to, go, to, to go do that, customer support, all these other, uh, all these other things. And so it's kind of more of a, it's, it's like you have, to, you have to basically, in my view, make the conscious decision, we're, we're not lean anymore. Like, we, we, you know, we're, we, we have to all of a sudden become fat you know, for, for good and valid reasons, because if we don't, somebody else is going gonna, is gonna to come do that to us. If you, look, if you think back in your mind to the companies you've been involved with that, that got to product market fit and think like in the months leading up to that moment, were there certain indicators or premonitions that, that looking back you realize were significant predictors that you were about to get it or really did it come out of the blue? Well, you know, there's a couple. Uh, you know, one is kind of the early, you know, the, the real early adopter phenomenon. Like, so we like to say our, our favorite example, uh, you know, of companies that are about to hit product market fit is, you know, really smart people doing something that looks crazy, but there's a small group of early adopters that are just enthusiastically in love with the idea, and basically everybody is laughing at the whole thing, right? It's a toy, right? Um, and uh, you know, it's it's sort of like 3D printing is kind of going through that right now. Like 3D printing, if you guys saw like 3D printing, the 3D there's a group of people who are now actually like starting to like actually manufacture guns. Like with 3D printers. Um, it's and like the uh, Homebrew Computer Club. What's that? It's yeah, like Homebrew home Computer yeah. Club. Wired, Wired, Wired Magazine uh, had a story last week as uh, the headline, funniest headline of all time, which is uh, Gun from 3D Printer Only Fire Six Shots Before Breaking. <laughs> and I'm like, how about Gun from 3D Printer <laughs> Fire Six Shots? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, the world just changed. You know, go pull all the murderers and you know armed robbers who are in prison, and go see if they would have been okay with a untraceable gun that fires six shots. And I think the answer would have been yes, <laughs> right? And so it's sort of this like, you know, people just laugh at. It. I mean, people laughed. It's, if anybody in the room who was at Twitter at the time, remember, people just laughed at Twitter. Oh my God, Twitter will never get out beyond the early adopter crowd. I mean, you know, there's no chance. You know, the whole thing. People laughed at Facebook. People laughed at Google because it was, you know, it was the 35th search engine, and like the other 34 were, ter you know, di weren't working as businesses. So who were these guys to think they could do the 35th? So, so they sort of combination of mockery combined with a super enthusiastic uh, early adopter customer base. Um, you know, that's a really big one. The other kind of micro version of that that's very interesting is when the employees in the company themselves actually are enthusiastically using the product. 
It's not even so much friends and family because friends and family can be coerced. Um, you know, Drew, 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 Drew can get his Drew can get his extended relatives to use uh, their new product if he really wants to. Um, but when the employees are actually using it daily in their lives and they really love it, you, you can just feel the difference between companies that actually have that property and the ones that don't. At, at least when they're building a product that the you know the employees might actually use. Um, and so that that can be a really good indicator. Is there a substitute to use in cases where the cus target customer is not at all related to the employees of the company and crazy consumer internet stuff? So that that's tougher. Um, so I, I like to say I think there's actually three sort of gradations of, of this thing. So there's there's sort of the founders build a product for themselves, um, which has this huge advantage of you know the the sort of the, the so we call this you know sort of founder market fit is the term we use a lot now. It's like clearly the founder is meant to do this and, and they resonate with it because they, they themselves are the users. It's sort of the best example of founder market fit. Then there's sort of the HP theory in the old days, in the old HP, which was so-called the next bench theory, right? So HP would have all these benches lined up, and each bench would make the products that the guys at the next bench <laughs> needed to build their product. And so, you know, the the you know the guys building the voltmeters were building for the team building oscilloscopes, which were building for radio transmitters and so forth, all the way down the line. So sort of adjacent markets. And so my favorite example of this is we have this company in San Francisco, we're proud investors in called Mixpanel, right? Which is a spinoff from from Slide, of, which is an analytics platform that's basically Slide caliber analytics you know for everybody else and you know they really wrapped their head around it because they had actually had that problem and now they're building for the adjacent you know they're building for the adjacent market um, and then the the hardest one but a very very lucrative one because it's harder um, is the you know building for somebody who you're not uh, and you know a lot of enterprise software falls in this category you know the, the shining example you know this this summer has been uh, you know workday uh, you know, which is a $10 billion company, um, you know, like the Workday guys may use their product a little bit, you know, but it's not something that, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to go check my Workday. Um, you know, it's, H it's, it's HR software and financial software for big companies, $10 billion, um, in, with a gigantic market opportunity. Um, and it's on those that, you know, professional product management really, really matters, right? That's where you have to be like super rigorous and super serious about product management. You can't kind of let it slide like a lot of companies that build for themselves. Or it, it's not intuitive. There's nothing intuitive about it, and so then it's 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 the whole practice of product management that becomes critical. And then you, you when we when we evaluate those companies, we gauge them on the basis of how strong is their product management that becomes one of the main issues. So picking up your story again for a moment, uh, you know, you and I both lived through the dot com crash in the same way that Private Ryan and General Patton also both lived through World War Two. Right. Um, and, general, and, and how General Custer lived through that, you know, the, yeah, no, sorry, yeah, wrong, oh, sorry, wrong, yeah. wrong, wrong, wrong example. But I, I've actually heard you speak very provocatively about, how, yeah. like, the fact that people don't really understand the dot-com crash and, and what that meant in history. Yeah, so I actually think it's really important to understand the dot-com crash because it informs a lot of the psychology of how the Valley works today. And it actually, I think it informs a fair amount about, about with all the work that Eric has done. So... There were some very, very valuable lessons learned from the dot-com crash. I mean, I think the lean, lean startup, you know, theory is, is one of the main ones. You know, lean startup is a direct, you know, reaction to the prevailing theory in 1999, which was so-called "go big or go home," which generally translated into "go home," or but go home very expensively. Yeah, or go home, go home back to your, you know, parents' house into your old bedroom. Um, kind of, kind of, kind of go home. Yes, very after burning through half a billion dollars in invested capital. So, so there are some very, very valuable things that came out of that. Um, I worry that we are, though, still, at least those of us who live through it, I worry, are still in a psychological rut to a certain extent. I think that there's a lot of um, psychological damage that was caused by people who went through it, actually, both investors and entrepreneurs. Um, and, I, and I don't think we're through it yet. I think we're maybe halfway through it. And the two things that I, I, I always highlight is, um, number one, maybe this, the most radical one is, I actually think all of the, all the dot-com ideas, I actually think were correct ideas. I think they were just early. Um, and so I, I actually think, I, I, I would actually say it's, it's hard to name an idea of the dot-com days, even the really crazy ones at the time, you know, the ones that were viewed in retrospect as being crazy, like Webvan and Pets.com. Like, those businesses all work today. Like, Webvan, Fresh Direct works today. Amazon is going to roll out groceries nationwide. Like, that model's going to work. And then uh, there's actually very now big e-commerce companies doing things like pet, literally pet food. Yeah. Uh, Diapers.com was an extraordinarily successful company, sold Amazon. Um, and so, literally, I think you can, you, you, those of you remember the Industry Standard magazine from, from the era, right, which itself, you know, blew up. Um, you know, for a while there, it was like 800 pages every three days or something. Um, <laughs> you know, mostly, mostly ads uh, of the company selling to each other. Um, good you, business model. You can, it's a good business model while it lasted. Um, it's a legal pyramid scheme. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can you can you can literally read the articles from that era, and you basically it's a catalog of startup ideas that are that are working today, right? Often with new twists and new spins, and they're mobile as opposed to you know all this all these all these things. 
But a lot of the ideas worked. It's just the market wasn't ready yet. And it was because, you know, still in the late 90s, there were only 50 million people online, roughly. Most of them on dial-up, most of them on AOL at the time. Um, and so the market just was not ready yet, and the market is ready for a lot of these things. The other thing that's really important about the dot-com crash, I think, is that it was only 18, or the dot-com bubble that led to the crash. The bubble itself, I think, was only 18 months long. Um, we kind of look back and we think of it as it was five or six years, because it kind of feels that way uh, in retrospect. But it was really only from the third quarter of 90, uh, sorry, from the, uh, yeah, from the third quarter of 98, fourth quarter of 98, um, to the first quarter of 2000. Uh, and this is actually important for those of you who didn't live through it, which is 95, 96, 97, people were getting, you know, a little happy. Uh, you know, they were one and then two martinis in, um, but not yet yeah, three or four. Um, and, then, um, and then 98 was actually a financial crisis. 98 was actually the Asian, uh, the Asian so-called Asian flu at the time. A bunch of the big uh, countries in Asia ran into trouble, and then Russia defaulted. And then this big hedge fund on the East Coast went down. And it was almost like the September 2008, kind of like a mini version of what happened in September 2008. And that really rattled investors hard. Um, and eBay went public that fall. And eBay only barely got public uh, during that period with what was at the time the best business model ever invented on planet Earth, because um, investors were completely freaked. And then after eBay got out and the Asia flu didn't affect, you know, didn't turn out to infect the rest of the world, then there was 18 months of just complete craziness. And then that all came to a screeching halt, you know, basically in, in, in 2000. And so now, you know, we're sitting here basically, right, the commercial internet is coming up and it'll be 20 years old next year. You know, my basic stance is, it, okay, dot-com bubble was bad, dot-com crash was bad, but it was only 18 months out of 20 years. You know, I think it's time to basically put a stake in it and bury it. Um, leave and, it behind. Yeah, leave it behind. Psychologically. Like, at some point, it's just, it's simply old news. Um, and and I, I get a little bit worried that it's it's the boogeyman. Um, you know, at, at its at its worst, the, the you know the danger is that it's the boogeyman that scares us off from uh, from attempting big things. The good news um, is that the 22 year old founders don't have this problem because um, they were they're in, not scarred. They don't. They remember. were in elementary school at the time. They were not paying attention. Um, and uh, one of the challenges for the 35 or 40 year old entrepreneur versus the 22 year old entrepreneur is to try to actually function uh, without the, the 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 trauma that was inflicted. So, so fast forward now, you know, you're, I think everyone agrees, really disrupting the VC business and uh, doing a lot of really cool stuff. I'd like to know, well, first of all, I hear complaints from basically all my friends who are VCs that entrepreneurs are constantly coming into their office with the same old crappy pitch, but with a lot of lean buzzwords tacked on, uh, <laughs> right. le basically right. lean washing the same old garbage pitch, but now it's got pivots and stuff in it. And they always say, well, you know, will you please <laughs> tell them to stop doing that? So first of all, you have that experience too? Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For a while there, it was just, you know, disruptive was the thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, so, yeah, now it's lean. Yeah, lean. yeah. Well, so sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, no, um, okay. But, I, you know, <laughs> I really want to tackle the most common misconceptions that people bring to you because you get the, the kind of the, 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 the front row seat for what these ideas look like in the wild, not in the, like, rarefied view of, you know, we get to control what people say on the stage and we have a nice, like, very clean uh, sequence of, of education. But, well, of course, when the ideas are released, people are allowed to do whatever they want with them. And I, I wish they would... We could just like license people to you know, only certain licensed people are allowed to use our ideas, but that's not fortunately how it works. So, so what are some things that drive you crazy uh, when they when they come into your office? Yeah. So the big thing is, I'll start. The, there's three that I want to focus on. The first one doesn't really drive us nuts, but I think we're an outlier on this point, and I think it's maybe an issue in the broader environment, which is not every startup can be done lean. Um, and and I would also phrase this as a challenge for the lean startup movement and for the lean startup theory. And I'll, I'll talk about that for each of the three. So not every startup can be done lean. There are some that simply, especially the ones that have the really audacious goals. Um, in some cases, that's exactly what Drew said. They start small, and then they become audacious. Um, in some cases, they simply start audacious, and they have to start audacious, because otherwise the product will never get to market. And you know, the old, in the old days, the ones I would cite, in particular, the Macintosh. You know, Steve Jobs always said, nobody ever asked for a Macintosh. I don't know how you would have ever lean, developed, or tested a Mac. Like, the product had to exist in its form on people's desks you know, to really wrap their heads around it, or at least that's what, what Steve certainly believed. Um, the Intel x86 chip, you know, 8086, was a major engineering effort. Um, and then you know, years later, Silicon Graphics, you know, which was a huge success, um, you know, was, was definitely one of these. More recently, Workday <laughs> was a fat startup. Like Workday was like 400 employees from the, from, from the word go. Um, and they're basically going to rip all the people soft customers, you know, <laughs> out from out from under. I mean, like it's it's work, it's it's like completely working. Um, but they had to build to mass right up front to be able to actually be credible in that market. Um, Nasira, this company we just sold to VMware uh, for is actually 1.2 billion, 1.26 billion dollar acquisition for a company that would have done about two million in revenue this year, which is the kind of multiple that we like. Um, 
when we can get it, the reason it got that price tag was because it was a major league engineering effort where it had to, it was going, you know, it's going up against the conventional way that networking is done by companies like Cisco um, after, you know, that have had 20 years to develop. And so it, it had to be serious. And then, you know, everybody's favorite entrepreneur these days for good and valid reasons is, you know, Elon Musk uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. But, you know, neither Tesla nor SpaceX could have conceivably, you know, been done as a lean startup. They, they, you know, you're not, <laughs> you, got, you got to get the rocket into space. Like there's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of effort involved in doing that. Um, and it, you know, they, they, it, it seems it, like what those examples have in common is that there's significant technical risk. You yeah. know, regardless of how much market risk you have to take on. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. And 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 this is sort of the old, you know, a lot of the bef before the dot com era, a lot of startups that VCs backed had that characteristic. Like if you were starting, it was common for VCs to back new computer companies in the 70s. Um, and yeah, you had to build out the company before you could sell the first computer, the product and the company around it. And so. I just, uh, this is sort of a, a cautionary note is I don't think we should let the lean startup idea, brilliant though it is and as widely applicable as it is, preclude us from being willing to fund and take seriously the really big ambitious efforts out of the gate. And then I think the challenge is, right, how to extend the lean startup theory, you know, potentially over time to encompass kind of these, 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 these bigger projects, number one. Uh, number two, the thing that probably drives us the most crazy in our day job uh, at, at, in venture capital is, um, lean startup methodology being used by entrepreneurs inappropriately, in my view, and I think probably in Eric's view, uh, inappropriately as an excuse to not take sales and marketing seriously. Um, we see that all the time. Um, it's very ironic because basically what we hear from entrepreneurs is all that matters is product. Um, if we build it, um, sales and marketing will happen by magic. Um, it'll happen automatically, which of course is field of dreams. If we build it, they will come, which is the sales and, market, sales and marketing version of the problem that lean startup methodology fixes on the product development side. Um, and so I think the, met the, the theory needs to be extended to uh, encompass sales and marketing. Uh, Steve uh, Blank and, and Mark Leslie have both made big pushes in this area with, with their approaches. Uh, but I think there's more work to be done. And beyond that, we just see a lot of entrepreneurs who we just think are fooling themselves. Um, the sales and marketing don't matter. A couple specific reasons I think they're fooling themselves or ways that they fool themselves. One is they're extrapolating, in our view, in a delusional way uh, from precedents. And so, you know, it's very common to hear, especially young entrepreneurs, say, well, you know, Salesforce.com is self-service and therefore my SaaS app will be self-service. And it's like, well, I don't know, Salesforce.com for a long time spent like 80%, right, of their revenue on sales and marketing. Like sales, Salesforce.com is actually legendary for their deep investments in sales and marketing. Um, entrepreneurs used to say Google is, is all yeah. self-service. Well, Google's got, you know, 15,000 sales reps. You know, they're doing something. Um, Facebook, you know, is a very large and sophisticated sales force. Of, Facebook sales force are hunter killers the same way that the, you know, Oracle sales force was or the IBM sales force was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and then, you know, Twitter's going to recreate the same thing. Twitter's going to build, is in the process of building a big sales force. So you're going to do ad sales. You're going to need a huge sales force. You need to say, you need sales, and you need to go get the money. Um, and, you know, another, another thing we see a lot, especially entrepreneurs coming out of Google or Facebook, um, we see them thinking that they can take their consumer methodology, and let's forget the fact that they maybe haven't even wrapped their heads around the fact that Google and Facebook have big sales forces, <laughs> but they say, well, I'm going to go do a business application, and then it's just going to go sell itself. Right, and especially like business, business, like businesses, like business applications do not just sell themselves. Like you have to actually go get the money. Um, and then the third thing we hear all the time, of course, is viral. Right, everything's going to be viral. <laughs> everything's going to be viral. And I got to tell you, I don't know what the number is, but it's like maybe one in a hundred or one in a thousand of the things where people, you know, where credible people say their thing is going to be viral. Like uh, the the safe assumption is your product ain't viral. <laughs> like the number of things that are actually viral is a really, really, really short uh, and select list. And it's magic. I mean. I'm totally in favor of viral, and I'm totally in favor of self-service, and I love the magic business models, and it's great, but like, it's really hard to find a real-world example um, of actually somebody who goes and gets the money without, without taking this stuff seriously. Um, so that, that, that's, that's one, and that's a big deal. Um, the third is maybe the most profound or the most kind of psychologically interesting, which is the pivot. You know, I said earlier, pivots, <laughs> pivot used to be called the fuck up. Um, the good news- Accidentally taking the stigma out of it. The, <laughs> taking the stigma out, just taking the stigma out. So, so taking the stigma out is very exciting. Um, one of the huge, I mean, you, you guys all know this, one of the huge advantages of the startup culture of Silicon Valley, of the United States, um, of the mentality that we all have of, of, of the lean startup theory, um, is that is that is that f failure is acceptable as as failures are acceptable as steps on the path to success. In particular, the way I think about it is, you know, if a failure is a basically a step through the search, right? So you're, you're sort of running the search to try to find the right idea and try to find the try to find the fit. And it, it, as you iterate through, you you fail, but you, as you fail, you learn, and then you ultimately figure it out. You know, your your sixth time, like that's great, and that's much better than failure being shameful and failure being terrible. 
On the other hand, what we see a lot are entrepreneurs who at least basically give up too quickly. Um, basically, it's, it's sort of permission to, to give up, and it's permission to give up very fast. Um, and if you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, about this, you know, they, they, you, you, by taking the stigma out, you basically, you know, it's, are, are they really going to do the heavy lifting over a long period of time required? If you talk to a lot of really successful entrepreneurs, even when their stories have been written, you know, that it was sort of up and to the right from the very start, a lot of times what they'll tell you is, oh, my God. It, you know, Sean Parker likes to say, right, being a founder, you know, being a founder is, uh, is like chewing glass, right? Eventually, you start to like the taste of your own blood. <laughs> Um, there's just a grinding kind of approach to, to, to the reality of how these things work. Um, and a lot of people, you know, had they given up in year one or year two, or in some cases year three or four, they, they would have never made it. Um, the worst case of that is what I call the failure fetish, um, which is, oh, failure is great. Like, failure is fantastic. Like, at Silicon Valley, we love failure. Failure is a badge of honor. Like, isn't it great? Like, I failed four times. I'm like, now, now, I'm, really, now I'm really experienced. This is wonderful. Um, and, you know, you've, you've all probably, you know, there are serial entrepreneurs in, in, in the environment. We have a running joke in our office is sort of, you know, boy, they really let repeated failure go to their head. <laughs> um, uh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, and, you know, the egos just get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's like, well, at some point, it might be nice to actually succeed. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I just, and, and the Valley's kind of always had, there's always a, this sort of cautionary note of, like, people are just a little bit too gleefully excited about failing, like, it's not quite right. Um, you got to get calibrated for just the right level of enthusiasm yeah, about it. <laughs> exactly. And so you want to preserve the good. You want to preserve the good about the idea of experimentation and, and, and pivoting, but you don't want to basically encourage people or have people be unintentionally encouraged um, to, to give up too quickly. Sarah Palin, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, right. you know, at, at least when Sarah Palin, you know, Sarah Palin. Don't be Palin, like Sarah Palin, is that what Sarah, you're saying? Sarah Palin quit right after two years being, you know, she was governor of, of Alaska for all of two years during which she was nominated to be vice president. And then after that, she decided it was too hard and she quit. And at least Newsweek, right, ran the cover, before they went, went under, at least they ran the cover photo with the big word below just said, quitter, right? Um, and at least, you know, they called her out on that. Um, and I just, I feel like maybe just, uh, maybe it's time to add a little bit more stigma. Just, just a tad, just a tad uh, back, more. Back yeah. to it. The entrepreneurs I admire, you know, I admire the ones who iterate. I admire the ones who pivot. I really admire the ones who succeed. And I really admire the ones who have persisted you know, in the face of huge adversity to succeed. And I think that's a really big part of success uh, in this industry because it is so hard, and I think it's important to preserve that. Yeah, one of our ambitions in Lean Startup is uh, to give people during that long flat part, and as you said, it can be very long flat part of the hockey stick, um, some metrics to look at that are not just zero, 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 but to give them some indication that they actually are making progress, those kind of like early green shoots, those early indications that, okay, you're not done, you're not at product market fit yet, but you're actually getting close or to product market fit. Yeah. And one thing I noticed that is in common in all the things that you've been talking about, and I've heard you say on other occasions that you believe Andreessen Horowitz is, is the long-term money in the market, maybe the last long-term money other than Warren Buffett, if I got that right. And uh, to me, that long-term vision is the thing I admire the most about what you're doing, that the Lean Startup movement is not about, although we celebrate pivots and iterations and failures uh, and you know these early metrics, it's, of course, in the service of building what we hope will be long-term enterprises. Right. And I wonder if you could talk about uh, how that kind of long-term thinking has, uh, has affected what you do now and, and how you see it kind of playing out through your career. Yeah, so what he's mentioning, we, we sort of joke, we sort of half joke, half, half truth, um, which is when we're feeling good about ourselves, what we basically say is we, we and Warren Buffett are the last long-term money in the stock market. Like, we're it. Like, there's like, there's like we're 10 plus years on like new stuff and he's 10 plus years on old stuff and that's it. You know, everybody else is high frequency trading, you know, down to the second or, you know, hedge funds are turning over their portfolios every three days you know, in between getting indicted for insider trading. Like, other than that, like, you know. Other than that, the system works great. The system works great. Um, so there's just, there's, there actually is very little investable capital um, for, if you talk to any CEO of any public company, they'll just tell you how shocking it is, how short-term all the, all the money is. And so I do think there's a huge benefit. And it's not just, obviously, it's not just, it's basically venture capital as an asset class. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of really top end venture firms that are really, really good at, at taking a long-term point of view. And I think it's one of the things that makes our industry really magic mm -hmm. um, is that we do, you know, I, I felt this way when I was an entrepreneur. It's, it's amazing that you, you know, in my case, it was Kleiner Perkins and Benchmark that would get behind me for years. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think that's really special. Um, I, th I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to figure out what's going to work, number one. It, it takes time, um, you know, and then, um, uh, you know, and that's just a big one. The other one is, I got to tell you, you know, entrepreneurs, <laughs> entrepreneurs almost uniquely have a problem with timing, in my experience. What, uh, another thing that the successful entrepreneurs all have in common, I found, is when they're doing their companies, they're in a complete panic that they're too late. 
right? It's like, oh my God, like I gotta go faster, I gotta go faster, because if I don't get in market, somebody else is gonna do it. Like this idea is so obvious, like I, you know, it's it's like, you know, days, you know, hours really matter, all this stuff, you know, work everybody's uh, we said, you know, it's our work week is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Friday. Um, <laughs> And, um, and and so there's this sort of is a sort of too late feeling. In reality, right? Entrepreneurs, by definition, live in the future, right? You're anticipating a world that doesn't exist yet, um, and so often, you know, entrepreneurs are too early. And and this also goes back to the persistence point. Is I'll give you an example. I I think 2012 is the year of SaaS. Like I think 2012 is the year. It's it's in this year that we're in, you know right, finishing up that basically SaaS has tipped, where even the largest companies in the world are now are now going to move to are going to move to software as a service. Like it's 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 basically people have gotten through um, in various ways issues security and reliability and all these other issues and there's enough references and and like the pipelines of the SaaS companies that are succeeding are incredible in terms of the kinds of companies that are that are in in, in process. Um, 2012, right? Well, Mark Benioff started Salesforce.com in 1999, right? Yeah. So 13 years, you know, to get to the real, to get to my view, what is the real tipping point for the market? You know, why was it 13 years and not 10 and not seven? You know, or for that matter, not 17, it just was. You know, stuff just finally got to the point, the psycho you know, sort of intersection technology got to the point, the business model got to the point, the stuff had long enough to bake, and then this sort of mass psychology, you know, thing happened. Um, and so I think a big part, I think this is, you, you see this a lot, uh, Microsoft, right? Microsoft starts in 1976. You know, Microsoft's real opportunity didn't emerge until 81, 82, right? When IBM came knocking, you know, to, with the, uh, you know, with, with the PC. Um, and so... And in the movies, those times are always collapsed down to like a two-minute photo montage. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we exactly. skip over like, the fact that like, it took seven, eight years It's like longer. when you take, you know, it's like in the romantic comedies when you take your new girlfriend shopping or whatever. It's like, yeah, it's like the happy music's playing and it's all fun. <laughs> Um, and everybody's and everybody's and everybody's coding. Um, it's a pretty woman, pretty woman uh, uh, reference there. Um, they're a little young. Yes, they are a little young. Um, <laughs> there used to be this big movie star called Julia Roberts. Um, uh, yeah, and it's just it's romanticized, right? And then the stories, the histories, right? History gets written weird, right? History, history, like the history of the winners is always, oh my God, what geniuses they were, everything was great, right? And the history of the losers is, oh my God, what idiots they were, look at all the stuff they did wrong, right? And the reality is, you know, usually exactly in the middle on that. And I think a lot of it in startups, a lot of it's timing, a lot of it is, are you in the market at the right time? Mm -hmm. One of our favorite, one of our favorite things we do at our firm is we, 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 we're, we're gonna, we're actually gonna systematize this, but we think, we think a lot about it, which is, you see these ideas, right? That that it's like you'll see you'll see the idea in like 1996, and then again in 1999, and then again in 2003, and then again in 2008, and then it's finally in 2012 is going to be the fifth company with that same idea that's actually going to do it, that's actually going to work. Um, for venture capitalists, that's actually fine because you can basically just keep you know re-upping. Uh, you know, if you're willing to be in venture capital for 20 years, you get repeated swings at the bat with these things. But for a founder, right? You're, you only get one swing. You only get one swing. Well, you, the psychological damage from failing the first time, right, will prevent you from doing it the second time. That's right. You never start the same company twice, uh, even when, when, when it would make a lot of sense to do so. Um, and so being able to persist, being able to, this is where we get in arguments with people about the optimal amount of money to raise. We're always telling people like raise more rather than less because you want to give yourself more time because you honestly have no idea how long it's going to take. Yeah, I wonder, like, I, w I was curious your take. I, one of those common misconceptions I hear from, from VCs is that they think lean startup means cheap startup. It means don't raise money. And I'm like, you know, most of us, Steve Blank, myself, we raise significant amounts of venture capital for the companies that we develop these ideas in. I'm curious where you think that misconception comes from. Well, it sort of comes from don't raise a lot of money and then lose it all, right? I mean, like... Right. <laughs> it's the losing it all part that yeah, we're talking about. Not, not, not necessarily having it. We'd rather you... Raise it and keep it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, look, the ideal, let's say the ideal case for fundraising is you raise it for a huge buffer and then you never need it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as you, I'll, I'll brag on Mixpanel again. Like Mix, Mixpanel, like we, I don't know if we invest like $10 million in it. It still hasn't spent a dollar of the financing. Mixpanel's got a lot of shout outs today. Yeah, yeah. because the, the growth has been, has been, the revenue growth has been so strong. So, so like that's the ideal case. But if, you know, that's, that's the case where like it, it just, it took it at exactly the point in time when, when Suhail thought it would. Um, you know, for a lot of other things, like you actually need the buffer. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I don't know. It it actually goes back to a big reason we started we started our firm and why I'm in on this side of the table now is because I ju I just you see so many smart people in the valley with so many good ideas and so many startups and so much potential and then so many companies um, sell out too quickly, um, yes. uh, give up too quickly, don't raise enough money. You know, one old VC saying is the number one reason for going out of business is running out of cash. You know, the one and only reason. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, uh, which leads to the corollary, which is cash is more important than your mother. Um, <laughs> you know, that's an old, 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 old saying, but it, it, it still applies. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I just have this real sense. I call it the, the puzzle of the missing campuses, right? Which is you, you drive up and down one, Highway 101, and it's like, oh, you know, there's Oracle, and oh, there's Cisco, and oh, there's, you know, Apple, and, you know, there's, uh, there's Google. And it's like, and then you've got miles and miles and miles and miles where there aren't any campuses. And it's like, well, why not? Like, where, basically, where are all the missing companies? Why aren't there 10 times the number of really important, successful companies? Why aren't there 100 times the number of important, successful companies? I mean, I think we have the talent. I actually think we have the ideas. Um, I just think a lot of these things get taken off the table too quickly. They, they actually, it's funny, they get taken off the table if they, if they, if they fail, yeah. right? If they fail too quickly or they're not fast enough to actually make it. Um, and then they also fail, ironically, or they don't fail, but, but the opportunity is foreclosed when they sell too quickly, right? As, to your, your point, you get product market fit, and it's like then the offer comes in, and then it's like it's life-changing money, and you've got to take it. And I just think there's probably another 10 or 20 you know, really important companies that ought to exist from the last you know, 10 years that just don't, um, you know, because then they... You know, get merged into a big company, and then you know sometimes that works out, sometimes it doesn't. But you you never get to see what could have developed. Do you feel that way about Netscape sometimes? Yeah, a little bit. That's a much longer conversation. I understand. <laughs> I don't I don't want to do therapy on stage again. We did that this morning. Yes. Uh, because I have you here, because you're really uniquely situated to answer this question. I can't resist taking a selfish. You no, know, you you sit on public company boards. You invest in companies, as you say, kind of have the two bad options of being acquired by a public company, which sucks or going public, which also kind of sucks, because now you have the short-term pressure in Wall Street and the high-frequency trading. Uh, you have, either way, this really relentless short-term pressure. And one of the ideas that, that I've advocated for in the book was to create something I call the long-term stock exchange. It would be an alternative place where long-term money and long-term founders could come together with different trading rules uh, to try and foster the kinds of missing companies that you're talking about. And obviously, can't ask you on the spot to evaluate that idea, but I'm wondering if you think, if we could slow the trading down, if we could impose higher fees, uh, and if we could ban the kind of short-term compensation instruments in companies, do you feel like, if that, if, forget the question, of, is that even possible, do you think that would help in nurturing the kind of companies we want to build? Oh, ab yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's actually simple ways to do it. They, they have absolutely no political support at all. Um, but you just like take the capital gains tax in companies and corporations, and you know if it's if you hold for five years or longer, it's zero percent. You know if you hold for you know one to five years, it's you know twenty percent, and if you hold for less than twelve months, it's eighty percent. Like you just you know you could you could literally solve it in the tax code. There's a bunch of other things that you could do. I, I think it's great. I, it's it's you know as you as you know it's it's not at least not right now the world we live in. You know, the world we live in right now is, it goes back to the dot-com crash. The world we live in right now, at least in the U.S., is a reaction to the scandals, right, that followed the, the, the 2000 crash. So we live in a stock market, you know, in a capital environment on the public side where the market rules are determined, I think, almost entirely at this point by essentially Enron and WorldCom. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's gotten to be incredibly inhospitable to be a public company now as compared to how it used to be. And it's, it's all with the view of protecting investors from themselves, which has the side effect of all but eliminating IPOs, um, which has a side effect just in numbers. Uh, the number of public companies in the U.S. has been cut in half in the last 15 years, right? Which, and so, and I sort, of, I sort of have two hats on this topic because, you know, as a, as a long-term private investor who can do growth investments and hold them for 10 or 15 years, in a sense, that's great because public investors can't compete with me because yeah. uh, public investors used to finance growth in all these companies. Um, on the other hand, you know, obviously it means our companies don't go public for much longer. I, I think it's also not a great thing socially. Uh, for the country it's because... Like the broadly shared prosperity the public markets enable is missing. And the public markets, a lot of the money in the public markets is retirement money, um, you know, of everybody from school teachers all the way through to employees and companies. And if, you know, if you're basically going to suck all the growth out of the public market, then the only thing that basically the, the pension money can invest in is companies that aren't growing anymore. Like at some point you have actually an issue with that. Um, what does that mean for a company? What we tell our companies is always the same thing, which is basically do not go public until you have built a fortress um, and we use that term specifically as basically build all the defenses to all the attacks um, that you're going to get once you're public. And that's, you know, and, b and by the way, good news is it's all high substance stuff for the most part. It's deep technology, right? A commanding market position, you know, your full executive, you know, team, uh, you know, all the way built out, you know, all the key positions filled, um, you know, your brand is established, um, you know, your, your sales and marketing is fully up and running. You have predictability in your business, at least for the next couple of years. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the tragedy right now is also a, a, a strong IP position, right, to be able to defend yourself uh, against Another a public policy thing that has to change. Yeah, exactly, which, again, there's absolutely no momentum uh, for, for in Washington. So I think th the, the side effect of that is it's just it's going to be a long time before it gets really easy to go public again. It's still possible. You just have to be super strong. And the market will really discriminate between the companies that are actually prepared for it and the companies that won't. 
the good news is that it gives all of us cover. But it, <laughs> it wasn't so great in 1999 either when the expectation was everybody had to go public within 18 months right. of being founded. Um, I took, we can find a happy medium. I took two, I've taken my, my first two companies, both went public within 18 months of being founded, and I would not recommend doing that today. <laughs> it's like an extreme sport. Um, not, not a good idea. Um, uh, and so the good news is that expectation is gone. Um, and so now I, I think it's great. The heroes are, you know, the Google guys and, 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 and Mark Zuckerberg and people, you know, who have, you know, in many cases are pushing their IPO out as far as they possibly can. Right, and building their companies up to maximum strength. And I, I think that's been a huge net positive for the Valley. Um, it's just, it's very important to bear in mind uh, the, how strong these companies have to get before they can actually go public. Yeah, all right, well, we're really incredibly honored that you're here. Now, I know so many people in this room are thinking right now, I'm gonna be the next Mark Andreessen. Uh, so, uh, you know, you think someone who's like gone back in time to the young you, but now they're armed with Lean Startup and all the stuff that we've been talking about. You got one, one last piece of advice for them? Something you wish you knew? Yeah, I don't know. Look, I mean, it's I, I, I've told Eric, I, I think lean startup, <laughs> I think the lean startup methodology is a little bit like, I feel like we've discovered the theory of relativity. Like, you know, we it, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's a fairly nice compliment, I think. It's a pretty good comparison. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> if you guys if you guys want to tweet that right this minute, I really don't mind. <laughs> it's just fine. Like, you know, there was a lot of stuff that was not understood, you know, until relativity came along, and then all of a sudden the, the, the world made a lot more sense. And so I feel like we, we, now we now have a system and a process and a method and a science uh, for thinking about things that really before, w without it, we really were stabs in the dark. Like, the, 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 the bad, in the bad old days, it, you know, a lot of this stuff really was just a stab in the dark, just guesswork. And so the advances that have been made by Eric and by other folks like, like Steve and Mark Leslie have, have, been, have been tremendous and are very important in our industry. I would just encourage the young, <laughs> the young whoever, I would just say it's it's very important. Like just like if you're building a rocket ship, like it's 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 great if it can go between stars. It also has to survive a reentry into the atmosphere. Don't forget the Newtonian. Newtonian mechanics. physics <laughs> actually still really really matter. Um, uh, and so um, uh, it, when you're building when you're building a company, think about building a company. It's great if it's good at lean startup. It's great if it's good at customer development. It's also great if at the end of the day, it's also good at old fashioned blocking and tackling. Sales and marketing, customer acquisition, customer support, all the stuff that 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 is actually involved in, in, in building a company to scale in the in in the in the in the real world uh, as it exists. And the combination, the entrepreneurs. I mean, I can't tell you when we see an entrepreneur come in and they 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 got relativity and they got Newtonian physics, we get uh, unbelievably excited. And right now, it's interesting. Right now, we see very few of them. And so I think there's a really big opportunity to to combine uh, to combine the the, the 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 old and the new. Yeah. Listen, uh, and I think thanks to your appearance here, I hope you'll see a lot more in the years to come. Also, thank you for make, giving a shout out to Mark Leslie, who I feel like doesn't get nearly enough credit for his contribution to these ideas. He's had a huge, can we spend a second on oh, that? Sure, so he's yeah. had a big influence on me. So he's the founder of Veritas, which was one of the most successful enterprise software companies ever. And so his thing is called the Salesforce Learning Curve. And for those of you who are going to have Salesforces, which is, I guarantee you, virtually you study all of this. you, um, it is really well, well worth looking at. It's the most comprehensively thought through approach to thinking about how to build, how, how to, the, sort of the theory around a Salesforce that anybody's done so far, and I think is incredibly valuable. All right, well, listen, I hope everyone will join me in, in thanking the one, the only, Mark Andreessen. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.